Welcome to Around BCC, I'm Keith Tebow. Record numbers of students have made their way back onto the campuses of Bristol Community College as the 2009 fall semester is in full swing. Now the new academic year brings with it some exciting educational opportunities. Case in point, BCC this fall is embarking on a new project where courses across many disciplines will incorporate the same one book. Starting last fall, the college assembled a committee which was charged with establishing a one-book program where college faculty and students would create projects around one universally accepted text. Quest Writing Lab specialist and one-book committee member Denise DiMarzio says the concept of one book is commonplace today in colleges and local libraries. She says that the BCC One Book Committee reviewed dozens of books for the project based on a desired set of criteria. The book had to have a wide appeal, you know, appeal to a good portion of the population. So, you know, it shouldn't have been something like, for example, the, the chick lit books, for example. We wanted to appeal to a wide audience. Um, we wanted it to be available in many formats. Uh, so it could be in large print, in other languages, um, have a film version, um, things like that, so that the, the most number of people could access it. Um, also, it should be applicable across a lot of disciplines so that many, many professors could pick up the book for their courses. After months of deliberation and collaboration with the general campus community, the One Book Committee settled as its premier project, Persepolis, a graphic novel depicting the childhood of its Iranian author, Marjane Satrapi. It's the story of uh, growing up as a young girl in the 70s in Iran um, at the, the turn of the revolution. So going from um, a nation of uh, a democratic nation, fairly broad-minded nation, to a nation that then became um, quite repressed um, and the state and religion joined together. And that caused a lot of issues um, on a daily person's life. Um, and it really puts a human face on the area. Um, it, Iran has been linked with um, the axis of evil. We all are familiar with that phrase uh, from our former president. Um, and this book really seeks to look at how a war affects real people on a daily level. Damasio says the book fits well into ensuring that as many students will be able to read the novel as possible. This book is good because it has both the uh, visual component and the written component, so that we thought it might be more accessible um, to an audience of people who don't read that much. Right? We're, we're trying to capture as many students as possible um, to participate in this project. And um, these days people don't read that much. So it, it has these two mediums working side by side and hoping that that will engage non-readers um, to become readers and think about, okay, this, I, I can read, this is a book for me. Um, it's very timely. We, did, we, we picked it prior to um, certain events that are happening right now, but it has turned out to be really timely for a situation in, in Iran at, the, at this moment. Demarzio says thus far the book has garnered cross-disciplinary appeal. You'd expect English to use it and you'd expect maybe reading tend to use it. Um, but some really interesting ways it's being used, um, sociology, psychology, a biology professor picked up the book, which I think is great, and she's looking at um, wellness and what, what, is the, what are the stresses on a person who's growing up in a war zone. Uh, that course is called um, the biology of wellness or something like that. Um, some are using it in psychology, using it for a uh, case study, doing a case study of the various characters. So it's really, you know, spreading out over, over many courses and um, a lot of students, you see a lot of students walking around with the book, reading it, and so that's just what we wanted to happen. Demarcio says this fall's One Book Project will be visible for more than just those who will be studying the text in class. We are going to have a film screening, but that's for campus only because of um, copyright issues. So that's a student event. Um, we're going to have um, a writing contest, 
um, an art contest, also for students, of course. We originally had a faculty panel um, discussion, and we're going to have um, sort of a midterm faculty panel to sort of gauge how's the book going, what's, what's happening with this book. And we hope at the end of the semester, sometime in early December, to have a, a closing event. Um, the public would certainly be invited to that. Um, and it would, we're hoping that it will be uh, announcing the winners of the contests, sort of a wrapping up of like what was this project and maybe a free microphone, people to say their comments, um, have a little ballot box there to vote for the, the next one book. And we're hoping to have um, some kind of art performance. Um, we may have Iranian puppeteers, we may have Iranian musicians. Um, so we're hoping for these things. Some of them are planned, some of them are sort of on the wish list right now. The Mazier says based on the early results, the One Book Project will likely be carried forward. I feel confident kind of calling it a success already, um, just based on the fact that so many professors have picked up the book and their students are reading it. So in, in that way alone, the, the, the core of the project was to get a lot of people reading the book. And that's happening. Um, if we have wild success where, you know, students are clamoring to be on the committee or things like that, um, that would be wonderful. But I think either way, we're going to keep going and try to make this an annual project for the college um, and maybe sort of get it into the consciousness of more and more people so that maybe, you know, greater percentage of, of people will pick the book up for their courses and really think about how can I work this into my curriculum and things like that. To find out more on the One Book Project at BCC, go to the college's website, click on Academics, and then find the One Book link. As humans, we often bring our preconceived perceptions with us when we interact with other individuals. Oftentimes, that results in not understanding the limitations or potential of others. The BCC Deaf Studies program recently held a series of events geared at making all of us more aware of the possibilities of those who are deaf or hard of hearing. What do we really know about those who are deaf or hard of hearing? That was the focus of the BCC Deaf Studies program during a series of events promoting a deeper appreciation of how the deaf culture fits into not only the colleges, but all of our lives. Deaf Studies program coordinator Sandy Ligren says those in the hearing world bring with them certain perceptions about the deaf culture, which are very often wrong. Some sort of common ones that I think impact deaf people and hard of hearing people the most are that, um, you know, all deaf people and hard of hearing people read lips and if they do read lips and do speech reading that that's 100% effective when actually only 30% of English is visible on your lips. So even if you're really good at it, you're still not really good at it and it's the context and the gestures and the other factors in the conversation that are outside of the language that are helping communication happen. Many people think that deaf people are somehow unintelligent um, and a lot of times that's a hard one to overcome because in our society which is sound based deaf people are at a disadvantage but that's because of the environments they're in not being deaf in and of itself. Um, so sometimes um, based on someone's upbringing, their schooling, just their life circumstances, they come to a place as a deaf adult, you know, with certain abilities, and people attribute, well, that's what it means to be deaf, where it might actually be, well, actually, no, this person is this particular way, and that person is this particular way, which is why you'll meet deaf people, some of whom speak, some of whom don't. Jim Dugas is a deaf student in his first semester studying digital photography. He says it's still difficult for him to fit in with other students who are not hard of hearing. I feel that sometimes the obstacles are, for example, I have difficulty taking everything in, especially when people are looking at me from the class. I'm a deaf person, this is who I am. And I have hearing peers from Deaf Studies who come up and, and we socialize and we sign together and interact with each other. Duga says he also has some issues in the early part of the semester communicating with professors. In English, for example, there's some difficulty with the teacher because I can lip read a little bit, 
And for example, the teacher will be speaking and there's another building that we go to sometimes for English. And I'll say, is the English class here? And the teacher will look at me like, the sound of my voice puts the teacher off a little bit. So I don't say anything. But I notice the, by the expression of the teacher, they're a little taken aback by my voice. Dugas does say that the people at BCC have made his transition back to school easier. For example, I need to read, I need to improve on my reading skills, I need to improve on my writing skills because I have some difficulty with those. The teachers here have helped me. I still struggle with it and it will take me some time. I just started September 8th, three weeks ago. So I feel like things are going well. I like it here. It was a little bit awkward in the beginning, but things are moving along. It has been a while since I was in college last. I was at another school, it was a school of design. I was only there a year and I withdrew from the program. They did not provide good services there. There were no deaf, deaf studies there or disability services and supports. So I do like it here better. Deaf and hard of hearing learning specialist Judy Joden Krosick works in the college's Office of Disability Services to meet the needs of the 20 or so students who need either an American Sign Language interpreter or other help in completing their coursework. She says faculty members who have a deaf student enrolled in their class are brought into the process early in dealing with that student. Each semester we have a pool of faculty who have a deaf student in their classroom. Every deaf, deaf student is different, but many of them are using American Sign Language interpreters. So each of those faculty members have an opportunity to meet with me individually or an intended workshop that I, that I offer to talk about accommodations and communication styles. I also offer them information from uh, PEPNET, which offers support to post-secondary institutions that are working with deaf and hard of hearing students. And each faculty member that has an experience can begin to lay the groundwork within their department of ideas of what worked and maybe what didn't work work. We have especially challenges in some of our more non-traditional classrooms, some of our science classrooms and our culinary classrooms, which um, go beyond a lecture-based format in terms of teaching, which is not always um, easy to develop the just the right accommodation for that particular student in that environment. Jodin Krosick says the goal of her office is to make sure the deaf student is not precluded from taking any class he or she wishes. And that translates into opportunities for those who wish to enter the deaf studies field. We're committed to not telling students, you can't take a class at this time, you can only take a class at this other time because I think I might have an interpreter available. We're trying to create an, a campus that's accessible to students and doing with as much pre-planning as we can, providing the reasonable accommodations that we can. We work in conjunction with the Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in Boston. They have an interpreter referral department, but we also have a strong pool of um, local interpreters who are interested in being a part of, of the community here and making things accessible. But if they can't all work at the same time. Yeah. And um, one of our biggest struggles is due to the need for um, people in the long run to enter the fields of interpreting and become credentialed and become certified and stay in southeastern Massachusetts and, and work. Others who are in need of education about the myths of the deaf are some of the students entering the deaf studies program. Ligren says students deal with handling these misconceptions early on in their studies through the research, through making a poster, through writing a paper, they're having their own aha personal moments outside of the classroom. We also do things within the class where I just say, you know, like, let's, let's get it all out and laugh at ourselves and move on. But it really takes several classes and several semesters. I think after one semester, they know the talk, they know what to say, but they still don't quite get it full heart, um, you know, full bodied understanding of what that, why that myth is wrong or the right information to correct someone. But, you know, having them research discussion class, you know, write papers, and certainly um, our requirement to mingle with deaf people is one of the greatest things you can do in a deaf studies program. Deaf studies student Diane Belanger first became interested in American Sign Language after seeing deaf actress Marley Matlin perform so well, staying with the beat of the music on Dancing with the Stars. She's also worked with deaf tutors and instructors. She says she was oblivious to deaf people in the past and now realizes that their abilities rivals those of anyone. There are some things that they're just a lot better at than I am. You know, they have astounding memories. You know, like my tutor, he, he, um, 
we were going over descriptions of people and and he was able to just look at them really quickly and then describe them head to toe every feature. I can't do that. And I was just um, fascinated with their interaction and all, even all the different ways that um, they grew up and their own ideas. And that's when I realized that they were all separately um, independent, that they weren't all the same. Some of them were very happy and open with their deafness. Some were a little, you know, um, sad that they were deaf or struggling more and stuff like that. So it made me realize that they have um, the same personal or whatever issues that everyone else has, but they're also capable of doing so much. Student Megan McCallum has personal experience with the deaf, communicating with her hard of hearing grandmother. She says the hearing world needs to respect the deaf world the same as any ethnic culture. I just think it's frustrating and it shows how ignorant people can be because they don't take the time to go out of their little bubble to see that there are people that are different than them and it's frustrating how rude people can be and they think that that's normal like oh like they're not normal there's something wrong with them and it's just aggravating like you sometimes you just want to be like listen like maybe you're not normal and it's very frustrating. Jodin Krozik says BCC is working on improving accessibility for all deaf students through the addition of hearing assistance technology where feasible. In conjunction with the students in the Deaf Studies program, the college also hopes to draw more hard of hearing students into BCC as their primary post-secondary educational choice. We are interested in making sure that vocational rehabilitation agencies and um, private as well as public high schools and other colleges know that we provide these services so that um, students can feel comfortable having the accessible post-secondary education experience that they need. Um, we have students actually that have been transferring from places out of state that do have services but they've been more interested in, in being um, home. So they've, we've had students transferring from uh, the NTID, RIT, which are schools that tend to provide these accommodations, but students who are choosing to be closer to home and um, in some cases this is also more affordable and it's great that we can provide an affordable, accessible education mm -hmm. to all of our students. The 8th anniversary of September 11th was commemorated at the Fall River campus by heeding a call by President Obama to promote the cause of community service. The BCC Center for Civic Engagement hosted over 20 local social service agencies to remind students, faculty, and staff of the importance of community service. Kim Rodriguez, student coordinator in the Office of Civic Engagement, says it's easy and essential for people to get involved in the affairs of their local city or town. Service learning can be anything that your passion is. Whatever you're studying here at BCC, there's a place for you to be engaged in the community. Um, the reason why we are doing it today is because I think we need to remember what 9-11 meant. We all remember what it looked like, what it smelled like that moment in time. And we really do need to pay reverence to that. But there comes a time when we stand up because that's what we do as um, Americans and that's what this college is doing as well, being in, engaged and actively involved in our community. Rodrigue says students have multiple community service opportunities as part of the college's service learning program. A lot of students, perhaps this is their first time knowing about civic engagement. Um, it's been around for about four years now. We have had a lot of students involved in the Be Enriched program um, at Tansy, Middle, uh, Tansy Elementary School. It's an after school program that was started by students here at Bristol Community College and continues. Um, so it has sustained itself. Um, a number of, of students also are with the Bold Coalition that I spoke about earlier. They've been placed there. Uh, we have a number of placements and a number of students are actively involved we just don't see them so I think when you say a movement it's good because we'll see our students that are actively engaged and moving around in our community. During a presentation held on September 11th acting associate vice president of academic affairs Michael Vieira reminded those in attendance that serving your community has a long-standing tradition and is needed just as much today as it was in the past. A long time ago when I, when I was growing up Neighborhoods kind of did that, you know, they were, they were people who would work together, they'd watch out for each other's kids, there were all these old ladies underneath grapevines who knew what you did 24 hours a day. And uh, at the time I didn't think it was such a great idea, but now looking back, it really was a wonderful um, 
experience, knowing that there was this network of support. Spend a little time with somebody, just spend a, spend a minute. You don't have to say anything, you don't have to do anything, but that ministry of presence, that ability to help someone just by being there, is really, really important. So I encourage you to do that. And I usually say, too, that it's like, um, you know, throwing a pebble in the pond. You know, you throw that pebble in and the ripples go out. What you do today, what you do tomorrow, what you do next week, you never will know what the impact of that action may be. You know, who will you help? Who will, who will benefit from what you've passed on, what you've passed along to someone, what you've passed forward? As rewarding as community service is, there are academic benefits for students as well. To find out more, contact the Office of Student Engagement at BCC at 508-678-2811, extension 2579. We once again this year will bring you profiles of some of the people who have succeeded after graduating from Bristol Community College. Time now for the first installment of Alumni in Your Community. Hi, I'm Arthur Paul, and I'm a 1992 graduate of Bristol Community College. Uh, I grew up in uh, Westport, and I went to Westport High School. And when I was at Westport High School, um, the counselors there always talked to us about the possibilities and the ad advantages of going to Bristol Community College. So um, unfortunately for me, I couldn't go right after high school. So I went back as an older student and did um, probably five years of nights before I did one year of days to finish my degree. What made me go to BCC was that I liked, um, I took one class there just to get a feel for how the college worked, and I really liked it. And the thing that I liked the best about the college was the professors, because they went out of your, their way to make sure that you were comfortable. And they knew that I was a coming back student, so I was older than most of the kids, and they really took time to work with me and make sure that I fit into the college. So that was, it worked out perfect for me. Right out of high school, I uh, went to work uh, for a bank in Fall River and spent um, a good amount of time there, almost 20 years. And then from there, I went to two credit unions and since I've been doing marketing ever since. So I've spent the last 20 years just doing marketing. It really wasn't difficult for me to go back to school as a full-time student. Uh, nighttime, there were mostly older people, so I fit in pretty well. But when you switch to days and you're going with all of the younger students, I thought it was really going to be hard. But it wasn't because I was older than them, so I actually became a tutor to a lot of the students. And the professors looked to me to help some of the students as we were going through. So it worked out really good for me because the kids could appreciate me for my age and my business experience. So they kind of came to me for ideas and suggestions. So it really worked out well. I am married to my wife, and uh, Elizabeth, and it's Betty, actually. And uh, we live in Somerset. We've lived there just over 30 years. And I have a son who graduated uh, Somerset High School as well. I did finish my, uh, got my associate's degree from BCC and went through the graduation and all of that. And I was really glad that I did because two years later, I graduated from UMass Dartmouth. And the day of my graduation from UMass Dartmouth was my son's high school graduation. So I couldn't go to my own graduation from UMass because I had to go to my son's graduation. One of the good things that the Alumni Association did and still does is every year when they send out their solicitation letters, they give you the opportunity to volunteer on committees and stuff. And um, they were looking for some help with marketing. And since marketing is what I was doing, I volunteered to help with some of their marketing challenges. And since then, I've stayed with them. I've gone through all of the chairs in the Alumni Association, did a couple of years on the foundation, and now I'm on my eighth year as a member of the Board of Trustees of the college. As a trustee for the college, I actually was voted in by the alumni. So when I go to a trustees meeting as an alumni, I can speak for the alumni and tell the rest of the trustees how they feel or how the students are feeling about the campus and what's going on. Because even though I'm no longer a student, I still am often on campus just 
meeting with other faculty and some of the students at times, and so you get a sense of what's going on. We also have a student representative, and they help us as well. So, and we have two other board members who are also alumni. So the alumni are really represented on the board of trustees. It's not a requirement that you be an alum to be a, a trustee, but I was elected by the alumni to represent them. Uh, I currently work for People's Credit Union, which is located in um, several, uh, six towns in Rhode Island. And our main office is Middletown, which is where I work, and I do the marketing uh, for the institution, which involves not just print ads, but everything from radio, writing the scripts, designing the stuff uh, that needs to go into print, and writing some TV commercials as well. I think one of the uh, things that as a trustee and, and in all of the involvement I'd have with the college, sure. the thing that always sticks out to me, and I think um, Dr. Sprague does it best with his graphs, is if you look what it costs to go to BCC and compare that to other schools, the cost is astronomically less expensive to go to BCC. And what we tell the students and what I always tell them is, your first two years you go to BCC and you get your foundation. From there you move on and you're gonna go somewhere else and that's where you'll graduate from. When you go for a job, nobody asks you, where did you do your first two years and where did you do your second two years? It's where did you graduate from? One of the things that really sticks out when you think of BCC is the education you get. Because the classrooms are much smaller in size, you really get a much better education than you can at some of the higher schools that have bigger populations. Their classroom size is so small that you don't run into a class where you're taking in an auditorium with 200 people and they don't even know who you are. So the quality of education and the professors who are willing to go way beyond what they're expected to do is uh, unbelievable at Bristol Community College. It's back to action for the men's and women's soccer clubs as they begin their second intercollegiate season. But unlike last year, both clubs are in rebuilding mode. The Bees men's squad compiled an impressive 11-2 record within their NJCAA Division III conference. Head coach David Allen says he has only one experienced player returning from that squad, meaning that there'll be a lot of growing pains. I don't want to put the pressure as far as winning on them that much. I'd rather, the pressure I'm putting on them right now is to get better than what they are right now, rather than looking at, uh, we need to win a game, we need to win a game. Forget about winning a game, let's, let's just get better. The Lady Bees are coming off a 7-5 2008 campaign. Head coach Angela DaCosta says injuries and new players have made playing together a challenge. It's frustrating when it's like learning to play an instrument um, and not knowing what keys to press and the sound's not coming out right, you know, And um, but it, time, time. Time will heal all wounds. <laughs> so we're hoping that, you know, uh, one, that the wounds for our, our injured players are going to heal soon. And because they are key players in that, you know, that frustration level will never reach the point where they, they don't want to play and, and have fun. It's been tough going for the soccer squads through the first month of the season, with the men compiling a 2-5 and five record and the women still winless at 0-5. That'll do it for Around BCC for this month. I'm Keith Tebow. We leave you today with a look at the art exhibit called Women's Work, currently on view until October 15th at the Grimshaw Goodowitz Art Gallery. Thanks for watching.